In this lecture, we will discuss Israel Shahak and Norton Mezvinsky's Jewish Fundamentalism in Israel. This is a really interesting text that has a lot of information that uh, these two uh, writers you know, put together and made available to the English speaking world. And so we're really indebted to uh, them for their important contribution uh, to uh, debates on Zionism today and the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Now, Israel Shahak was an Israeli. He lived from 1933 to 2001. Norton Mezvinsky, 1932, still alive, is an American Jew. And I, and I think one of the things that's really interesting about this project is how these two men worked together, collaborated to produce this document from an, both an American Jewish perspective and an American and a, uh, Israeli Jewish perspective, making it accessible to readers who might not otherwise have access to this information. And so what I would want to emphasize here is their intervention as translators. This, they're, they're, in effect, this is a work of translation. They're doing a work of translation for us because they uh, acknowledge that many, much of this literature is not available outside the Hebrew, Hebraic speaking world. And those within that world are generally reluctant to translate this material, to let it be known outside of this particular context. And so many of the readers of this text are not uh, only, uh, let's say, those in favor of uh, equal rights in Palestine or ending the occupation of Palestine, but uh, they're also Jewish readers who, you know, many Jewish readers don't read Hebrew except perhaps, you know, religious Jews and even them, you know, uh, might be able to read a little bit during bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, but to be fluent in Hebrew is, is quite another matter. And so they're, they're uh, making this material available for Jews and non-Jews alike. And they say almost every sophisticated Israeli Jew knows the facts about Israeli Jewish society that are described in this book. So they acknowledge they're not telling us anything new. These facts, however, are unknown to most interested Jews and non-Jews outside Israel who do not know Hebrew and thus cannot read most of what Israeli Jews write about themselves in Hebrew. These facts are rarely mentioned or are described inaccurately in the enormous media coverage of Israel in the United States or elsewhere. The major purpose of this book is to provide those persons who do not read Hebrew with more understanding of one important aspect of Israeli Jewish society. So again, I, I really want to emphasize here their role as translators. This is in effect a work of translation and translation can take on many guises, but in this case, they're translating one context to another and they're collaborating as an Israeli Jew and an American Jew. And they do, they do a, a wonderful job of concisely presenting this material. Now I'm gonna just review some of the key ideas. You have to read the text itself to get most of the statistics. I want to just look at the main themes, uh, particularly again for those who are coming to this, these questions or trying to seek to understand the Palestinian-Israeli conflict themselves uh, and may not be that much that, that familiar with the region. So they've done a particularly good service for, uh, for those kinds of readers. Now we could call this a, a sort of a mea culpa critique of Jewish fundamentalism. They're speaking from inside of the Jewish experience and they're acknowledging faults within the, the uh, Judaic community, the Hebraic community, and or the, 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 the community of believers and uh, ethnic Jews as well. And so they're, they're speaking as Jews about Jews and uh, they're, they're bringing up stuff that, that many would probably prefer that they didn't speak about at all, but they feel compelled by urgent reasons, which they're going to tell us about to uh, make this intervention. They say, we cannot help seeing Jewish fundamentalism in Israel as a major obstacle to peace in the region. With our hearts and minds, we want Jews together with other people to recognize and strive for the highest ideals, and I would say of the European Enlightenment. I'm adding this because this, like the work of Edward Said, this is an appeal grounded in enlightenment tradition of, of reason and human rights, even as we fall short of them. As Jews, we understand that our own grandparents or great grandparents believed in at least some of the views described in our book. Similarly, in the past, slavery was universally practiced and justified. 
The inferior status of women was a global phenomenon and the belief that a country belonged to an individual or family and was heritable uh, was common. Now, uh, so there, again, this is a human rights-based critique, a belief, an egalitarian appeal that they make to, uh, you know, ideals that are inscribed in the UN Declaration of Human Rights and other important documents of human rights like the U.S. Constitution, the Magna Carta, and so on. That's, that's, that's where they're coming from as uh, Jewish uh, intellectuals. We believe, they say, that awareness is the necessary first step in opposition. We realize that by criticizing Jewish fundamentalism, we are criticizing a part of the past that we love. And this is an important point to recognize. We wish that members of every human grouping would criticize their own past, even before criticizing others. And I, I think this is an important uh, uh, appeal that they make, that wherever you're coming from, you know, you got to uh, look at yourself first and, you know, be aware of the racism within your own community before pointing the finger at other communities. And that's what they're doing. Because we believe that a critique of Jewish fundamentalism, which entails a critique of the Jewish past, can help Jews acquire more understanding and improve their behavior towards Palestinians, especially in the territories conquered in and occupied since 1967. So in addition to a general critique of Israeli society itself, seeking to move Israeli society in a more progressive democratic direction, they're also this, they also envision this text as being an intervention in the ongoing you know, problem of the occupation of Palestine, which like Edward Said, they're, they're clearly uh, opposed to. So um, they, one of the things that they criticize, so, so let's, let's be clear that although their focus is on uh, you know, Jewish fundamentalism, fundamentalism is not a particularly Jewish phenomenon. It's something that is present in all of the Abrahamic traditions. And this is just one instance of a much broader phenomenon, which is not confined to the Islamic tradition, to the Christian tradition, to the uh, Jewish tradition. Fundamentalism is a tendency in all of these traditions. And one of the components that they recognize in this, uh, in, in fundamentalism, as a sort of a nostalgia or desire to return to the good old times, the good old days when faith was allegedly pure and practiced by everyone. Fundamentalists believe that in the good old days, all the evils associated with modernity were absent. So if we put uh, the, the messianic kookism or messianic fundamentalist Jewish uh, 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 practices in the West Bank and Gaza by this, this percentage that's seeking to colonize the West Bank, um, we, we can see that there are, there are other varieties of fundamentalism throughout the world. If we think of, for instance, in the uh, Islamic tradition, the Wahhabi tradition at, at its most extreme can become akin to a kind of Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, ISIS type movement, Salafism as well. So this tendency is present in, in this Islam, fundamentalist tendency. It's present in the Christian tradition as well. Protestant tradition has uh, elements of this, and there are Christian fundamentalists as well who uh, act in militant fashions, which we'll, we'll discuss in passing. But our focus here is going to be on, um, particularly on uh, Judaic messianic fundamentalism. And so one of the other uh, points that they make besides this desire to return to this, uh, this pure nostalgic past, let's say in the case of Islam, to the days of the prophet Muhammad during this period when he was alive in the Protestant tradition of Calvin and Luther, the days of the apostolic church, uh, this sort of uh, nostalgia for perhaps a past that never even really was, but, but, but imagining a, a utopia of, of the past. This is one of the things fundamentalisms have in common. But another important uh, thing that they have in common is a belief in a pure and pious religious community that they believe existed in the past. And so there's also, then this enters, this raises the question of blood uh, inheritance, which we find, let's say, in the Shiite tradition, the belief in, uh, you know, if, if one is a noble blood descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. But this is also in Sharif and blood nobility ideologies are also in Sunni articulations of Islam as well. It's particularly, for instance, prominent in uh, Northwest Africa 
But uh, messianic, uh, the idea of a messianic remnant is present in Judaism, a remnant that's set aside through whom the Messiah is, will, will, uh, will come is, is the belief. And you have this in Christianity as well. Now, the, the Branch Davidians, for instance, in Waco, Texas, had this kind of messianic ideology as well. David Koresh imagined himself to be a, uh, uh, a, a, a somebody who had this was a direct ancestor of Jesse, the father of uh, David, and had this sort of this. We spoke of the when we speak of the branch Davidians. I mean the the branch as in the stem of of Jesse, and so he one of the reasons why he uh, tried to impregnate as many young girls as possible was he believed that the Messiah would come through his lineage. Well, this led to a terrible situation, which FBI stormed the silly in Waco, Texas, many people were killed. And then uh, and then, in, in commemoration of this, Timothy McVeigh bombed the Oklahoma City uh, Federal Building, killed many more people as well. And so all of this, my point is, is that the, 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 the Koresh Davidic uh, Christianity is very similar to the Messianic Jewish fundamentalism, that, th- that this is not something in Judaism specifically, but it's a tendency that one can find in all three of the Abrahamic traditions, although we're focused, we're going to focus here, particularly on on the question of uh, its tendency in uh, Jewish fundamentalism. Here's what they say: although possessing nearly all the important social properties of Islamic and Christian fundamentalism, Jewish fundamentalism is practically unknown outside of Israel. And so th- this is why they are doing this important work of translation for us, because we see in the media all the time stories about uh, Islamic, so-called Islamic fundamentalism, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and so on, and more militant varieties of Wahhabism, and, and also with a Shiite tradition, like, for instance, with Hezbollah in Lebanon. But, uh, but we almost never hear anything about uh, Jewish fundamentalism. And so they're, they're not only being translators then, they're addressing an important absence in discourse and thereby uh, alerting uh, many readers who are, would have been totally oblivious to this phenomenon outside of uh, Israel. And in Israel itself, the problem then is the silence. This is something Edward Said talks about, this, this, this uh, desire not to talk about this dimension of, of, of Orthodox Judaism. They state, we emphasize mostly the messianic tendency in Jewish fundamentalism because we believe it to be the most influential and dangerous. The fundamentalists oppose equality for all citizens, especially non-Jews and so-called Jewish deviants such as homosexuals. Now, Rabbi Cook, the elder, uh, one of the main, let's say, theoreticians of this messianic tendency in Jewish fundamentalism is the reverend father of the messianic tendency, said the difference between a a Jewish soul and souls of non-Jews, all of them in different levels, is greater and deeper than the difference between a human soul and the souls of cattle. Ouch. (laughs) One of the basic tendons of the Lurianic Kabbalah is the absolute superiority of the Jewish soul and body over the non-Jewish soul and body. According to the Lurianic Kabbalah, the world was created solely for the sake of the Jews. The existence of the non-Jews was subsidiary. Now, this, this is obviously very problematic if you believe or affirm in this idea, as, as, say, Edward Said does in his question of Palestine, the idea of universal human rights where all people are created equal and are equal before the law. This is a very different notion of this. This is, this is implying then that only certain people, the, the world was created only for certain people. Now, you have a similar thing, like, for instance, among Calvinists, the view is that when Jesus died on the cross, he only died for Christians. That what what's said in Calvinist uh, theology is that um, that the uh, sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was, I think, how it goes something like this: it was uh, it was sufficient for all, but it wasn't efficacious for all. So this idea then enters into the Calvinist Protestant tradition. You find this in the thought in the writings, say, of Nathaniel Hawthorne of the Pur- the Puritans being a kind of a chosen people as well. So this idea of chosenness is that one is, again, it's not just in Judaism, it's, it's in all of the Abrahamic traditions. 
uh, and it's, uh, it's something that implies that there are fundamental ontological even differences between different kinds of people. But it's going to, as we'll see in the, in the ideology or theology of, of the Gush Imanim, the Kukas, the Messianic Zionists, it becomes uh, an ideology of blood as well, as is, as is also the case in Sharif and Islamic traditions. So why, why should uh, Shahak and Mezvinsky's readers care? I mean, if there's a bunch of, if there's a group of sects out there that have very particular beliefs, um, why not just let them believe what they want to believe, leave them alone? Now, this would be a view that one might articulate in a liberal context where you have liberal separation of religion and states. That's not quite as clear in the uh, Israeli context and uh, and, and because it's, Israel is not a liberal democratic state, one could argue it's a the theocratic state even or an ethno-democratic state, but it's certainly not a liberal democratic state wherein you have a separation of religion and state given the fact that the uh, law of return is so clearly predicated on theological and um, biblical blood claims to owning, you know, to having possession of so-called promised land. But their concern is that Jewish fundamentalism is capable not only of influencing conventional Israeli policies, but even Israel's nuclear policies. And Israel has a very powerful nuclear arsenal. So if you pull the, uh, the, the far right, the fundamentalists into the political realm, we have the same very, a very similar situation in the United States. But if you, if, if you involve um, people who have fundamentally irrational views that, that could get their, let's say, fingers on the nuclear codes, that could be quite uh, dangerous. He's going to say, uh, the, the way they're going to argue this is Israeli society, Jewish society is divided more on religious issues than generally assumed outside of Israel, where belief in generalization such as common to all Jews is challenged less in Israel. So they're going to, let's, let's look at their breakdown and we'll compare it. And I have another lecture on the same channel looking at Thomas Friedman, an American Jewish Zionist's views on um, the demographic spread of Jews in Israel. And they're going to break it up like this. So secular Jews make up 25 to 30 percent, traditional Jews, uh, 50 to 55 percent, religious Jews, 20 percent. Now, uh, Friedman breaks it down this way and from Beirut to Jerusalem, secular Jews, 50, modern Orthodox, 30 ultra-Orthodox 15, Messianic Zionists 5%. Both are, the, they're essentially the same figures. If we look at these two categories of secular Jews and modern Orthodox, which make up about 80% here, um, Shahak and Mezvinsky are saying, you know, traditional Jews 50 to 55, secular Jews 30. They're, that, that makes up about that 80%. And then religious Jews that Friedman is calling you know, uh, 15 percent uh, ultra orthodox and 5 percent messianic Zionists. Um, they they make up this category that they're calling religious Jews. Now, this is what their focus is is going to be on is religious Jews. And while they do say that the messianic Zionists are the most dangerous, and they're going to focus on that, I think it's important to note that they're that they're bringing to our attention, you know, non-egalitarian views in the in the theology of the or, or ultra orthodox community as well. And so, while whereas the ultra orthodox and the messianic communities should not be conflated because they have different ideas, I mean, their their theologies are different. Nonetheless, there are important parallels with respect to the the particular kinds of human right question human rights questions that that these authors are engaging in. So here's how they, you know, uh, here's how they're going to divide this up. So the religious Jews in Israel are divided into two distinct groups. The members of the religiously more extreme group are called the Haredim, who are divided into two parties. The first, Judaism of the law. This is the Ashkenazi, the European Haredim of Eastern European origin. And the second is the Shahs, the party of the Oriental Haredim, who, who are of Middle Eastern origin. So you see on the left there the Ashkenazi or the European Jews, and then you see on the right the Sephardic um, community, and they're both religious Jews, but they have these different ethnic uh, heritage as well. Now, here's what they say. More than other secular Israelis, members of the Israeli right insist upon Jewish uniqueness. An essential part of the right's emphasis upon uniqueness is hatred of the concept of normality. We can think of the universal human subject as a concept of grounded of, the, of a normal 
human standard that's general that includes all of the human community. That is, the Jews are similar to other peoples and have the same desires for stability as do other nations. This is precisely what the, what the far right is rejecting. Jews are not the same as other people. They're not normal. They're exceptional. They're unique. They're chosen. That's basically the claim. Uh, the left, by contrast, in Israel longs for normalcy. This is the majority of people, really, and wants Jews to be a nation like all other nations. The entire Israeli right, on the other hand, is united in its resentment of the idea of normalcy and its belief along the lines of the Jewish religion that Jews are exceptional, different from all other nations. Religious be Jews believe that God made Jews unique. So it's a, uh, it's a Judeo-centric view and uh, the essence of this view is the, the notion of the abyss that separates Jews from Gentiles. So again, this this group is a minority within Israel and they don't they don't articulate the views that most Israelis articulate. They are quite clearly a religious minority like we have here in the United States, religious minority say in, in the deep south and so on. But the, the, the majority of Israeli Jews, that let's say people on the left particularly, want you know, for Israel to be a nation like any others and to have a standard akin to others, but they're, they're at odds. So the, these tensions are present in Israel, and that's, that's the point that they're drawing our attention to. Now, the, the danger is that the Haredim, this religious community, can put themselves in a position to dictate uh, to the Israeli secular majority. And this is really the problem. So it's not just a problem for the Palestinians. It's also a problem for Israeli Jews who don't, who, who don't affirm the ideas of these extreme religious communities to, uh, you know, they don't, they don't want these ideas to rule their life. Now, I, if you, I'm speaking largely here to Americans. This is my perceived audience. And we can think of this in the United States, how say someone like Donald Trump, who's not a particularly religious person, nonetheless depends upon the support of, of a very conservative uh, element in the Christian community, the Protestant fundamentalist Christian community, regardless of the fact that he is in no way at all uh, a Christian fundamentalist and who's probably never read the Bible in his life. Netanyahu is in the same position as Trump. He needs the support of this extreme right in order to consolidate his part, his power as a right wing politician. So the same dynamic that we see in the United States is also at present in Israel. And that's one way to think about how this minority influences Israeli politics. And, and one of the reasons why Shahak and Mazvinsky are so concerned about their, their growing role and their growing power in Israel. Not Netanyahu, it's unlikely he could have risen to power without the support of, uh, of, of the Haredim. And this is uh, this gives the Haredim a particular kind of power that's dangerous, again, not only to Palestinians who live on the West Bank and Gaza, but or even Golan Heights, but to, um, uh, to the, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to Israeli Jews themselves. Now, one of the interesting points that they make here is that the teachings of the Messianic Jewish, uh, Jews, like Rabbi Kook, they see as comparable not to the worst forms of anti-Semitism, and uh, and they even consider it to be a form of Stalinism. And they they criticize now. There you can see Gershom Sholem who lived from 1897 to 1882, and and Sholem is a very respected. Uh, scholar and a very respected theorist of Kabbalah and other things. Walter Benjamin had a, a interesting correspondence with him, but they're pointing him out as an instance of someone who just remained totally silent on this aspect of Jewish fundamentalism. It's just, it's just not talked about. And so what they're doing is they're speaking about what is unspeakable, and they're also saying Authors like Sholem should have talked about it. He sh it's, it's hypocritical for him to remain silent on this very dangerous uh, ideology that is influential. Now, a few instances of what is dangerous about this ideology from Shahak and uh, Mazvinsky's perspective. Let's let's look. Let's just review a few uh, key points. And one of them is the Haredim views on women. It's a, it's a, arguably a very misogynistic. 
uh, movement. They say the Haredim repeatedly refer to Jewish women engaged in politics as witches, bitches, or demons. The numerous misogynistic statements in the Talmud and in Talmudic literature constitute a part of every Haredi's male's sacred study. The statement in, uh, in uh, Tractat, uh, tr uh, excuse me, Tractat Shabbat, page 152b, defining a woman is exemplary. A woman is a sack full of excrement. So you can see there on the far right, a uh, this is a woman who is a Haredim woman. Who's, she's she's veiled every bit as much as, a, as the women in the middle who are wearing burqas in Afghanistan, wives of the Taliban. And there you see on the far left, you know, nuns. Now the nuns show their faces, but the idea again is this, this conservatism that, that completely covers women up. It's in it's in this Jewish fundamentalism as well, and uh, so it's very uh, situation for women is very difficult in this uh, tradition. This is the point that they're drawing our attention to. This is one problem uh, of uh, this ideology. Now there's an image of Rabbi Kuka from 1865 to 1935. He's the key figure who articulated this fundamentalist uh, theology. But uh, drawing from the teachings of the past. And for instance, here's the thought of uh, Mamamides, but remember he's writing, you know, the year 1138. This is, so this is a very uh, old fashioned, certainly view about women, a misogynistic view that you find even in Mamamides. Here's Mamamides. The sages uh, commanded a father not to teach his daughter Torah because most women never intend to learn anything and will because of weak understanding convert the pronouncements of Torah into nonsense. Now, this is also, this this view is very much at variance with, let's say, if you're a Reformed Jew living in the United States, many synagogues have women as, as rabbis. And this this is a key difference between um, this, this fundamentalism and more uh, progressive articulations of Judaic theology, like in the Reformed Judaic tradition in the United States. Now, similarly, there are really hostile views to homosexuality in the Haredim community. Here's what Shahak and Mavinsky say. Uh, Jewish fundamentalists have displayed severe enmity against Jews who adopt a different sexual lifestyle. According to Jewish religious law, homosexuality is punishable by death by stoning, and although the punishment is not clear, lesbian relations are forbidden. Many rabbis, when interviewed, indicated that they favored imposition of the death penalty for the Jewish home, for Jewish homosexual men. They tend to leave uh, lesbians alone. But that's a, obviously uh, like this is a, the former president until very recently of Gambia had the same view that if you know if you were homosexual, you should be put to death. And this is a view that one may find in, in very uh, extreme Islamic communities as well, but it's it's a view that's very common among the Haredim, is that, is that if you're homosexual, you deserve to die by, by stoning. Now, many Israeli, Tel Aviv, Israel has a very vibrant LBGT community, and so there are many secular Jews where this is a, a watershed issue that they're, where they're very much opposed to the views of the Jewish fundamentalists, if you're secularist in Israel. Uh, now, what's perhaps even more uh, important for thinking this question through in terms of human rights issues, the question of the human subject, like in the Kantian sense of cosmopolitan right, is the question of the Haredim on blood laws. And this is where it gets very, um, you know, based on old, you know, old notions of uh, blood purity. This is where, you know, kosher laws come into play as well. But they they take many of these ideas quite, you know, literally. Um, here's, let's read, for instance, uh, here's the view of a rabbi named uh, Yeshua Scheinberger. He says, he asks the question, you know, uh, is it permissible uh, for a pious Jew to receive a blood transfusion from non-Jews or from Jews who do not observe Jewish religious laws? Uh, Haredi rabbis fear that receiving tainted secular blood or non-Jewish blood might cause a pious Jew to behave badly and even, heaven forbid, harm his observance of the, of the religious Jewish religious laws. And so if you get a blood transfusion, you're going to get that bad blood mixed with your blood, the secular blood, and that may cause you to do uh, wrong things. 
Therefore, uh, they, the authors of this text state, a pious Jew who does not urgently need a transfusion and who faces no danger in waiting to receive blood from a strictly religious Jew should wait. Um, and then this extends, for instance, to uh, breastfeeding as well. The Jewish religious law says a Jewish child should preferably not be breastfed by a non-Jewish woman because her milk consists of forbidden food and contaminates the child. So these blood laws, it has to do with the, with the belief, again, that goes back to this idea of the Messianic chosen remnant, that there's something about, uh, about Jewish blood that is, that is different and particular. And um, this extends then that therefore you shouldn't get uh, transplants from organ transplants from non-Jews, for instance. Um, you should not certainly, uh, uh, you shouldn't under any circumstances transplant Jewish organs into Arabs, all of whom hate Jews. And then we find Rabbi uh, Yitzhak Ginsburg in 1996 stated, if every single cell in a Jewish body entails divinity and is thus part of God, then every strand of DNA is a part of God. Therefore, something is special about Jewish DNA. If a Jew needs a liver, can he take the liver of an innocent non-Jew to save him? The Torah would probably permit that. Jewish life has an infinite value. There is something more holy and unique about Jewish life than non-Jewish life. Okay, well, this, this view is obviously very much at odds with um, those who affirm universal human rights, like in the UN Charter, the Kantian view of cosmopolitan rights. It's a very different view. It's rights based on blood, blood identity, uh, the, the, the blood that flows through your veins, rather than the, the fact of, say, you know, residency, where we're all, you know, have to occupy uh, the same, you know, same, same, we only have so much land to occupy. We all have to get along with one another. This is a very different view indeed. Uh, and it goes so far as Rabbi Ginsburg claiming that a Jew killing a non-Jew does not in itself constitute murder. It would be more akin to like, let's say, the slaughter of an animal. So uh, these are, again, these are not the views of most Jews in Israel. This is the view of a minority, but it is a part of this tradition. This is what they are, the authors are drawing our attention to. Um, here's, here's another instance of this from uh, a rabbi that they quote, a Jewish fundamentalist rabbi. The difference between a Jewish and a non-Jewish person stems from the common expression, let us differentiate. Thus, we do not have a case of profound change in which a person is merely on a superior level. Rather, we have a case of let us differentiate between totally different species. Now, this is pure uh, racism. This is what racial essentialism effectively, much like, say, the views of Gobineau in Europe in the 19th century. This is what needs to be said about the body. The body of a Jewish person is of a totally different quality from the body of members of all nations of the world. The Jewish body, quote, looks as if it were in substance similar to bodies of non-Jews, unquote. But the bodies only seem to be similar in material substance, outward look, and superficial quality. The difference in inner quality, however, is so great that the body should be considered as completely different species. So as you can see here, it's not, although uh, it's comparable to racial essentialism like Gobineau, as I said, it's also a matter of, you know, an, an ideology that is, that is based in something that is completely imperceptible. This, this, uh, this, this substance that is, uh, you know, the, uh, of blood that flows through our veins is completely uh, unobservable. When we look at the external world, two people may look exactly alike, but there's something fundamentally different about them based in, uh, you know, in who, who has this DNA and who does not have this DNA is one way of perhaps saying this too simply. The similarities between the Jewish political messianic trend and German Nazism, our authors tell us, are glaring. And that's certainly true if you read Hitler's uh, Mein Kampf, you find similar ideologies of blood election there as well. The Gentiles are for the messianists what the Jews were for the Nazis. This hatred of non-Jews is not new, but is derived from a continuous Kabbalistic tradition. Those Jewish scholars who have attempted to hide this fact from non-Jews, like, say, Gershom Sholem, and even for many Jews, have not only done a disservice to scholarship, 
they have aided the growth of this Jewish analog to German Nazism. Well, these are very strong terms, um, but again, if, if you look just in terms of the concepts themselves, the parallels are unmistakable for thinking about this just on the level of concepts and ideas. Here's the views of the Gush Imanim. The Jews are not and cannot be a normal people. Their eternal uniqueness is the result of the covenant God made with them at Mount Sinai. That would be the Mosaic covenant. While God requires other normal nations to abide by abstract codes of justice and righteousness, such laws do not apply to Jews. So this, this place is not only reject, this implies not only a rejection of the universal human subject, but of, of, of universal laws themselves applicable to all people everywhere. They don't apply to Jews for the Gush Imanim. No rabbinical authority disputes that it would be ideal if the land of Israel were inhabited only by Jews. The entire Muslim world is money-grubbing, despicable, and capable of any things. All Christians, without ex exception, hate the Jews and look forward to their death. Well, these are just more, you know, instances of some of the uh, rhetoric that these authors find problematic. Now, um, I want to draw attention to just a couple of instances that they uh, illustrate in their text as perhaps some of the most dramatic cases of this. We can think of the of the Goldstein mass shooting at Hebron. Now he was he was an American fanatic and crazy person who lived from 1956 to 1994 at Hebron. You can see there this is the tomb where Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca are reputedly buried and many Muslims were worshiping and he came in and just with the machine gun and a terrorist act just killed uh, a lot of people and then they uh, finally were able to take the gun from him and he was himself killed as well in that melee. Uh, this was an event that while uh, terrible and unspeakable was celebrated by many of the Messianic Zionists as a uh, as a positive event. Um, it's akin, we, we're not unfamiliar with these kinds of incidents here in the United States. If we think of the Dylan Roof mass killing at the church in Charleston, South Carolina on June 17th, 2015, when he, this, uh, this uh, white supremacist came in and just, you know, killed a bunch of people who were having a, a Bible study in effect. It's a very similar kind of incident. Now, uh, this took place some time ago. I'm going to show you a brief clip here of a, uh, of, of a uh, recent coverage in Israel of this uh, event. But um, there's an image. I took this picture in uh, uh, last summer. This was at, uh, at Hebron as well. And, and during this, what is called the Cave of the Patriarchs massacre, perpetuated by this American Jewish fundamentalist man, Goldstein, 29 Palestinian Muslims were killed. Another 126 Palestinian Muslims were wounded. This took place now about 25 years ago. There's the tomb of uh, Abraham, and you can see it's uh, guarded by uh, wire and, and metal. And there's an Israeli a soldier outside of the tomb of Hebron, who is that that area whole now that whole street where the mosque is is being occupied by the Israelis. This grave holds the body of the deadliest Jewish terrorist in the history of the modern state of Israel. Twenty five years ago, Baruch Goldstein, an American Israeli settler, walked into the Ebrahimi Mosque armed with a Galil rifle and 140 rounds of ammunition. As 800 Muslim worshippers knelt down in prayer during the holy month of Ramadan, Goldstein opened fire, killing 29 men and children and injuring another 125. I was one years old, but uh, was like uh, all my family talking about it because uh, my cousin, he was killed in that massacre inside the mosque. This street used to be a bustling market. Shops now are closed and the streets are deserted. The consequences were also political. 25 years later, that extreme fringe is still causing controversy. Goldstein's portrait still hangs in Hebron, 
on the wall of Itamar ben Gvir, a former Kahana organizer and activist, and one of the more prominent members of the Otsma Yehudit political party. Netanyahu has also urged Otsma Yehudit to join the right-wing nationalist Jewish Home and National Union parties and become a single party that would ally with him in the next parliament. The move has been widely condemned across the political spectrum, but ben Gvir says the party is not Kahana's. I'm against killing Arabs. I've said this hundreds of times in public. I do think that Dr. Goldstein was a doctor who saved the lives of my friends. I do feel that I owe him. And by the way, my views are no. Yes, I'm in favor of the death penalty for terrorists. Yes, I'm in favor of deporting those who are not loyal to the state of Israel. The specter of the massacre still haunts the city, from the ghost town of the former Palestinian market to the shade of Israel's former radical political past, once again vying for power. Ari 11 Waldman from Hebron. And Hamad Al-Qasim for I-24 News. So that that was about a year ago that that uh, that marked the 25th anniversary, and you can see it's still quite a very vivid aspect of the Israeli political scene today, and still contested the events that took place. But uh, effectively, it was it was a massacre of of innocents, and but some people and these settlers venerate this figure Goldstein uh, as if he's some kind of uh, prophetic hero. Here's one rabbi in 1994 said, since Goldstein did what he did in God's own name, he is to be regarded as a righteous man. And here was what Rabbi Ariel said, at his, Israel Ariel said at his eulogy, the holy martyr Baruch Goldstein is from now on our intercessor in heaven, almost making him of a saint. Goldstein did not act as an individual. He heard the cry of the land of Israel, which is being stolen from us day after day by Muslims. The Jews will inherit the land not by any peace agreement, but only by shedding blood. All right, so there's, you know, there you have it. And uh, today, this tomb, which we saw in that brief clip, is a kind of a pilgrimage site for, you know, delegations of pious, so-called pious Jews from all Israeli cities, religious settlers, and so on. So this man, what he did was not, very different from what Dylan Roof did, but he's regarded not as a uh, as a lunatic terrorist by the religious right, but as a kind of a hero and even saintly intercessor. This is indeed um, problematic, and they're bringing it to our attention for this reason. Now, the the second other largest example that they bring, which you should be aware of if you're unfamiliar with these issues, is the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin about around the same time, November the 4th, 1995, uh, by a Jewish fundamentalist named Yigal Amir. Now, this fundamentalist uh, killed Rabin because of the deal that he made with, uh, with Arafat uh, on the White House lawn with Bill Clinton presiding a peace deal. This is the, known as the Oslo Accords, uh, but uh, Amir and many other Jewish fundamentalists saw it as an act of treason on the part of Rabin's, on the part of Rabin, because he was giving away Jewish lands. That's how they saw it. Although the deal, as Said and others have pointed out many times, was hardly favorable to the Palestinians, it was still too problematic for Amir and the fundamentalists. And this 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 young man at that time, he was only. 25, but he was uh, filled with the fervor of Jewish fundamentalist uh, dogmatism, and he killed uh, Rabin. It was a very tragic moment in the history of Israeli uh, politics and a turning point for uh, much of what was to take place after Rabin's assassination. Um, as Shahak tells us, he was murdered. Rabin was murdered for religious reasons, and, and the murder and his sympathizers were and still are convinced that the killing was dictated by God and was therefore a commandment of Judaism. And so this young man was hardly repentant. He said something like, and now I've done it, bring me some schnapps. And he was very, you know, arrogant and about it after he was arrested. Now, after 25 years in prison, it looks like he's. Uh, doesn't look quite as smug as he did 25 years ago, but it was it was essentially like the case of Goldstein was uh, was a, was a murder, and uh, but one that uh, is still it was an assassination still viewed by Israelis in Israel that are fundamentalist Jewish people as a an act ordained by God. 
And uh, this is, uh, you know, this is what I think we need to bear in mind is Rabin was not, it wasn't a, an Islamic terrorist fundamentalist who killed him. It was a Jewish uh, fundamentalist terrorist who killed him. Here's what uh, Shahak and Mazvinsky say. An intellectual compromise with Jewish orthodoxy is no more possible than it is an intellectual compromise with any other totalitarian system. This is again why they also describe it in some sense as a kind of a Stalinism. An apologetic approach to the Jewish past, which in reality is false beautification, a past that never was, and falsification of one part of Jewish history and is intended to remove the horrors and persecution that Jews suffered at the hands of their own authorities and rabbis only increases the dangers of a developing Jewish Khomeinism. And this is what they see as something that, that could happen. Uh, this is something that, that is not, uh, hasn't happened, but it's, it, it's possible. And this is one of the reasons why they're drawing our attention to this dangerous Jewish fundamentalist uh, ideology. And they tell us it should not be forgotten that democracy and the rule of law were brought into Judaism from the outside. Before the advent of the modern state, Jewish communities were mostly ruled by rabbis who employed arbitrary and cruel methods as bad as those employed by totalitarian regimes. The dearest wish of the current Jewish fundamentalism is to restore this, uh, this state of affairs. The predominant wish ideologically is to return to the supposedly good times when everything was seen and kept in proper order. And this is very similar to the Wahhabi Al-Qaeda movement as well, or the Wahhabi-based Al-Qaeda movement. Our firm belief is that a fundamentalist Jewish regime, if it came to power in Israel, would treat Israeli Jews who did not accept its tenets worse than it would treat Palestinians. And that's, that's a very interesting claim. Um, certainly, they're making an appeal saying, look, it's not just Palestinians who are threatened by this. Israeli Jews who are not fundamentalists are threatened even more than the Palestinians. Well, there's the tomb of Abraham. This is this brings a conclusion to this uh, lecture. This tomb of Abraham is there in Hebron still. Um, and sadly, Hebron is which should be a place for all people in the world to, vi uh, to visit and uh, pay homage to the prophet Abraham, who was a prophet for all of the Abrahamic traditions, is now uh, a very dangerous place and is filled with uh, Israeli uh, armed guards and is been, the streets have been cleared off around it and is still quite contested, uh, sadly, to, sad to say. So I hope that this brief introduction to Jewish fundamentalism in uh, Israel has been informative. And I just, again, would remind you that this is one form of fundamentalism. There are many other forms of fundamentalism, uh, but this is one that we should also be aware of, not just, we shouldn't just be aware of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so on. We should also be aware of this fundamentalism as well, as well as fundament, Christian fundamentalisms in the United States.